Hi everyone, I'm back again with another installment of the Spotlight series. Today we'll be dissecting some of the claims made by Doctor of Chiropractic, Dr. Berg, wherein he discusses how ketones can be beneficial against cancer, preventing us from getting it or even fighting against it once we have it. So let's tune in. Learn Your Body, a science-based education. Well, here's my viewpoint based on the data that I have. I believe that a healthy ketogenic diet with intermittent fasting and periodic prolonged fasting can prevent cancer. And it is the diet and program to prevent cancer. Why do I say that? Because the actual cause of cancer is mitochondrial damage. Here, he mentions that the ketogenic diet and fasting can help prevent cancer because cancer is caused by mitochondrial dysfunction. This is a gross oversimplification, and while we could leave it at that, it actually leads us to incorrect conclusions unless we delve into the details more. While mitochondrial dysfunction is thought to be a contributing reason for why cancer progresses, it certainly isn't the only reason or necessary condition. It is also necessary to have certain key mutations in the DNA of the cell beyond that found in the mitochondria for cancer to occur, because cancer is always held in check by a number of different cellular systems. So no, we do not know every cause of cancer, and while mitochondrial dysfunction is one contributor, it isn't the sole reason. This is important to know because if the assumption is that mitochondrial dysfunction is the sole reason, it stands to reason to look to our diet for a solution when it often cannot be. So let's move on. You have two types of ketones. You have the ketones that are produced by a low carb diet. And you also have ketones that are produced when you're fasting. Two different processes. There is some very strong evidence to show that cancer cells can also consume ketones, unfortunately, okay? But when you get your ketones, from fasting, something else happens. You get this massive anti-cancer effect. You get the help of your immune system. You have get the help of certain genetic um, things that are occurring that are very anti-cancer. So the ketones that occur when you're fasting are not going to uh, feed the cancer like it would when you're just doing a low-carb diet. Here, he mentions that cancer can feed on ketones, which I'm really happy to hear because most keto enthusiasts leave that out, and he's right. Certain cancers, like certain breast cancers, can feed on ketones. This means, contrary to his original point, not all cancers can be based around this notion of mitochondrial dysfunction, because mitochondrial dysfunction would imply a reduced ability to use fats and ketones for energy. Clearly, this is not the case. However, he takes things one step further and mentions that ketones from the ketogenic diet and ketones from fasting are different. They are not. They are both produced by the liver. While prolonged fasting produces much more of these ketones, they are still the same ketones. He then attributes the ketones from fasting as the reasoning for their effect at stopping cancer, which is a false conclusion based on the available information. One, we know that ketones produced are the same. Secondly, if we know the first point is true, we look for differences between the two strategies, not similarities, to determine why one is effective. Fasting and the other is not. Ketogenic diet, according to Dr. Berg. So what other hallmark trait does fasting have that the ketogenic diet does not? Well, it has many, but surely the complete stoppage of food consumption is a major one. So this is a more likely reason for stopping cancer than the ketones. However, it could still be other reasons as well. Again, I should also caution that certain cancers grow more quickly on ketones, regardless of their origin. Next. Also, when you're fasting, your normal cells are a bit protected from chemo and radiation if you go that direction. So these ketones actually give you more protection when you're doing fasting, okay? And what's interesting about that is the cancer cells don't get that protection. So right there, that's a, that's a really cool advantage. The ketones when you're fasting also enhance the effects of radiation. Which, uh, there's some interesting data on that. I'll put some links down below. He briefly mentions that ketones from fasting help in radiation therapy and chemotherapy, which is all well and good. 
And he then cites a lone study, and the study is on a ketogenic diet, not fasting. So, well, make of that what you will. The eating plan for cancer um, should be low carb, it should be low protein, it should also be low fat. Also, it should be high in phytonutrients, as in a lot of nutrient-dense vegetables, okay? So this gives us a problem because we're on, now we're on a low-calorie diet. We're not trying to go low-calorie, we're just trying to starve off that cancer of various fuels that the cancer cell is dependent on. And then if you add a lot of fasting in there, you're not going to be eating anything at all, so it, it gives us another problem we have to solve. The cool thing about the phytonutrients from plants is that they are selective. In other words, a lot of the phytonutrients from plants are anti-cancer. They create apoptosis, which causes a cell to commit suicide, but only the cancer cells. Your own normal cells do not commit suicide when you consume the phytonutrients from these uh, leafy greens. Finally, he mentions that ideally, an anti-cancer diet is low in all of the macronutrients fat, protein, and carbohydrate, which would mean that the diet is low in energy content, inhibiting growth as a whole. Then he discusses phytonutrients, and he has a point here as well. It's true that preliminary evidence shows many phytonutrients, like resveratrol, may have some mild positive effects in slowing cancer. But most of these studies are, at the time of this recording, in cell culture, meaning they are in isolated cells with only a few clinical studies that show a range of positive effects from mild to pretty dramatic effects. But these clinical trials are open and suffer from some methodology issues. Still, this is a promising area of research, to his credit. At any rate, Dr. Berg misses the mark in a few areas, but he also mentions a few important concepts, which I appreciate. And with that, I hope that you learned a thing or two. And with that, I hope to have the pleasure of speaking with you in the near future. Bye.